Cool. I'm doing a little bit of prep for the demo that we'll, I'll do at the end, but uh, sometimes provisioning and sleep functions on machines that are not happy. So I want to make sure we have a nice demo for you. Um, if this, this talk is about immutable infrastructure. Uh, if you were in the last talk, which I think we lost a lot of the room um, and have a whole new set of faces, um, this is actually a really nice segue to that. How many people are, are used to the words immutable infrastructure? Wow. All right. We will probably blow through a lot of this talk, um, or I can go faster. So if things look like they're good, um, I'll, I'll pause a little bit and ask for thumbs up. Um, there's parts of this talk that are designed for people who don't know anything about what immutable infrastructure means. Hey, and all the machines are coming up now. And then at the end of, the, at the end of this, I'll give you a, a demo that shows a fully immutable provision, um, in this case for virtual machines, but that is designed from a, a physical infrastructure automation uh, piece, and that'll be part of the, part of the story. Okay. And one of these keys does that. Uh, so this talk is about immutable infrastructure. It is, is appropriate for the CI-CD track because immutable infrastructure um, and CI-CD seem, like, seem to be going together like peanut butter and, but, peanut butter and chocolate. Um, and it's a lot about security and shifting left, and we'll talk about those things. Uh, my name is Rob Hirschfeld. Um, you may know me. I've been involved in the OpenStack community for a long, long, long time. Uh, I'm also the founder of a project, an open source project called Digital Rebar, which is a physical infrastructure automation provisioning tool, part of what we'll be showing in the demo. Um, I'm also deeply involved in the Kubernetes groups, um, and my whole career has been about automating infrastructure. So zero touch, uh, fully automated infrastructure is what I spend way too much time doing. Uh, and this talk actually starts with our goal of building a self-bootstrapping Kubernetes cluster for KubeCon uh, in Austin. What we wanted was to be able to roll out a rack of gear, turn it on, and have Kubernetes come out the other end. And we built exactly that. So it was a zero-touch, in-memory, bootable thing. It installed Docker, uh, elected a leader, did uh, kube admin, brought everybody in, no human intervention at all. You're welcome to go try that out in the digital rebar community, something we call crib. And there's a ton of presentations and videos and things like that. That is not what this talk is about. What this talk is about is the reason is that as cool as that was, it was harder to maintain than we felt it should be. And this talk is about how do you take that experience and make it even easier to manage before somebody turns on that first button. Uh, and so that effect of having to maintain this install when the dependency graphs changed, when Docker changed a version or a, a repo broke or somebody moved something around made us pretty sad. So the question is, why is this type of configuration so fragile? And if you're used to, if you've been in the OpenStack community for a long time, this statement should not surprise you. Configuration is very fragile. And it's fragile because it's mutation. So what we're doing in a configuration system is we're actually changing the system. And anytime you change a system, you run a risk of something changing in that environment. So if you're just doing something as simple as taking completely clean set up machines that have never been touched before and running an Ansible playbook on it, you will find that that Ansible playbook will break very often because something that it depended on broke in the environment. Okay? It's just the fact of life. It's what configuration is. But we have to do better. Right? I'm doing a lot of work in the edge infrastructure pieces. That is not an acceptable thing replicated thousands of times. Right? A 1% failure rate in an edge deployment is 100 sites that you have to visit. So what we want to do, what we talk about a lot, is infrastructure as code. We want to be able to do that, right? That's our vision. However, all the mutability of doing this configuration make things really hard, right? We have traditional in-place approaches, but those have dependency graphs that break things. We have variation in the environment that makes it very hard to create a standard deployment process. 
Um, and it's even harder to lock down that configuration. So once you've deployed it, we all want day two automation. Well, that means that we're actually touching the systems. Idempotent operations are very hard. If I'm gonna run an Ansible playbook twice on a system, it's highly likely that I'm gonna get a failure or in strange results, especially if that Ansible playbook changed between hands, let alone I was applying it to multiple places. I wanna be able to roll back. When I make a mistake, if I identify a bug, I wanna go back to where I was. That's very hard with a configuration management system. And that ends up creating intermediate states, indeterminate, sorry, indeterminate states. So the answer is to lock it down, to do less of these dangerous, powerful but dangerous operations in the field. And that's really what we're talking about. This is what immutable infrastructure is about. It's about taking something and not having to change it in that deployment process. It's really about taking pre-deployed configuration, if you don't like the word immutable, when I talk to people who don't care for that word, um, like idempotency, um, another unfavorite word, but it's really pre-deployed configured infrastructure. And this is how we would look at it. So in a traditional process, we code, we build, we integrate, we deploy, then we configure our systems, right? Ansible, Puppet, Chef, Salt, however you want to do it. We're, we're deploying, then configuring. What we really want to do is switch that around so that we do that configuration work before we deploy. Sounds great, except that would mean that you would have to configure every single machine, create a unique identity, a unique configuration for every machine you wanted to deploy. And that's not particularly feasible either. So in practice, what immutable deployment really looks like is we do as much configuration as we can before deployment and then a little bit of initialization post deployment. So does that make sense? If you're familiar with the cloud init pattern, this is the cloud init pattern. If you're using Docker, <coughs> Docker has initialization. Uh, if you're doing hardware like we do, um, we use cloud init also or we put our agent on to do a little bit of post, post configuration. If you wanna take this a step further, there's a really good book uh, by Justin Garrison and Chris Nova called Cloud Native Infrastructure. And they go not to infrastructure's code, but infrastructure's software. And it starts talking about intent-based computing where you actually can assert a target state. And in that case, you have a state manager that takes these immutable artifacts and does all this work for you. And that's Kubernetes. And this is, although a Kubernetes conference, <coughs> um, this is not a Kubernetes presentation. Immutable's a much broader pattern about what we're doing, um, right? What we're really trying to do is say immutability is a pattern that we're gonna see in containerized infrastructure, in uh, VM infrastructure, and then for us that we also are bringing into physical infrastructure so that you can do that exact same pattern because it's very powerful. And the reason it's powerful is because we're taking a lot of this work that in the field becomes error prone, dangerous, and hard to maintain, and we're shifting it left in the pipeline, and we're using a create destroy pattern rather than a patch update pattern. So it looks like this. Traditional deployment, you would take your package, you take your, your server provisioning, you configure it, all that's good, until the next hour comes and there's a patch, that's fine. A day later, there's another patch, okay. And at some point, you have insanity. Right? Any living system is going to have a normal stream of patches. But the problem is each time you apply a patch, especially across a, a broad cluster or an environmentally distributed infrastructure, you end up with, very, with highly variant systems that are effectively becoming snowflakes. And that is a very serious issue if you're gonna try and maintain OpenStack. One of the things I, I like to say as people talk about OpenStack or Kubernetes being hard to manage or configure, it, it's a part of the way we build the systems today. It's not actually the fault of the, the software and the platforms, right? If we're trying to configure things in the field, we're going to have these problems. And here's where immutability does, goes a long way to making us less sad about the snowflake problem. So what we do instead is we say we're gonna go from a package server, provisioning the server, configuration, configuring the server, and then destroy it, right? We can't patch it anymore. That, we know that's not gonna work. We need to go to a destruction pattern. So how do we patch? We patch at the beginning. So in this case, we apply our patch, we, we uh, configure the system, we provision it, we do a little bit of configuration. When the next patch comes, we do another destroy operation and another destroy operation. The benefit of this pattern 
is that instead of having a snowflake at the end, we actually have a single reproducible asset that we can then provision over and over again. If we need to go backwards because there was a mistake, we can go backwards in time and go back to that last asset. So this becomes a much more reproducible pattern for managing complex configurations. We do all that work ahead of time. We minimize what we actually do in deployment. And fundamentally, that's cloud-like behavior. If you're doing work in clouds, which everybody is, you should be using this pattern or seeing this pattern, right? It's the cloud init pattern, if you want to see it. There's a whole bunch of ways we do it. But it's, it's been a very powerful way to do this pattern. It's the same thing with containers. We, we see the immutability in containers all the time. So ideally, ideally we go into this cloud-like integration, the stage workflow, where we ask for a state. I want, here's my machine, go set it up. At the end of it, you get back that state. We're trying to treat infrastructure as a black box. If you're an operator, black boxes are scary. Right? They're scary to me. I, I like to build systems that are very transparent in operations. And so what we really want to be able to do is understand that things are going on behind the box, see them when we can, but not have to deal with it. So we want the benefit of very simple black box, and then we want to be able to, when we need to, crack open that box and do our deployments. One of the things that makes people nervous about immutability is they feel like they're just handing off stuff into a black box. If we can eliminate that, and make operations much more transparent, then we've created a, an actual serious benefit. And one of the things that has been surprising to us uh, as we've been embracing more immutability in our deployment strategy is there's actually a lot more visibility into what happens in an immutable deployment than there is into what happens in a traditional netboot deployment. So if you're used to netboot, kickstart, or precedes, then those are very black box. It's incredibly hard to troubleshoot what goes on in those deployments. If you have a disk configuration or a network configuration problem, the system hangs, you have to serial terminal into that box to find out what's going on. In an immutable infrastructure, we'll talk about how this works, you actually can see the entire provisioning process go. What, what actually is booting is a much smaller and simpler boot process. So, I'm gonna pause for a second because I'm going at lightning speed through these first slides because everybody raised their hand about knowing what immutability is. People following so far? It's good, I'm seeing thumbs up. All right, let's talk about how to actually do it because now you got the theory in, in about 50% less time than I normally talk through this theory. So immutable patterns, there's not one thing. There's not one right way. So I wanna give you a couple of different options in how to pursue this and walk into the process without having to go all the way into straight deploying images, because they're all useful. The simplest and the base, this is, this is sort of what we, uh, number two is what we built for the Kubernetes deployment, is to take what you're existing, you, you're already doing, which is deploying some base image. So you take a base image, you configure that base image and you run it. So imagine this is your OpenStack cluster, or your Kubernetes cluster, you get your generic uh, operating system laydown. You put your keys on it. You run your scripts. Your Kubernetes cluster comes up. Everything's good. Instead of ever rerunning that script, what this would have you do is tear down that node, reprovision it, and then rerun the script on that node to reconfigure it. You never would rerun that, that Ansible or Chef, Puppet, Salt, whatever script, Bash, I guess. I like Bash. Um, on, on the system because it's, you're, 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 not, you're following this immutability pattern. So there's never any pre-configuration or whatever was left over from behind. And this allows you to have very re reliable, repeatable infrastructure. You avoid the, the snowflake, you avoid the idempotency, right? So an upgrade becomes a rolling upgrade where you're tearing down one system at a time, you're rerunning your automation for the new version, and then letting hopefully good things happen as that system comes back online. The challenge with this is that it, it's slow, right? You still have to go through the whole configuration process. You still have your dependency graphs to resolve. What you've really gained from this benefit is that you don't have the snowflaking effect of how your system's going. You also have a lot of peace of mind because now you're not counting on the fact that somebody might have hand tweaked that system to make it work and you didn't know what they did, which happens quite a bit. Uh, there's a variation of this, which is what we built for our Kubernetes install, which is the live boot plus configuration. 
uh, com the Kube community loves this pattern. If you're used to CoreOS, the CoreOS pattern is this pattern. They, they in-memory boot uh, a very minimal operating system. They do a small amount of configuration, which in that case involves dragging down a whole bunch of containers, because all their configuration is really containers. Um, and then when, you, when you're done with that system, when any patch comes out, you destroy the system by rebooting it, because it's an in-memory system, and then you start over, right? This, this pattern is really good if you're planning to rev a lot, because you never take the time to install the disks, so your, your footprint for doing this type of system is, is pretty fast. You often still need to mount the disks, by the way, to store data for the, uh, the Docker machines and things like that, so our Kubernetes deployment, it literally mounts the disks, installs Docker to the disks and things like that. Only the OS is really in memory. Um, there's a downside to this that you have to be very aware of. As, as cool and interesting as this pattern is, it makes your provisioning infrastructure a critical path system. So if you're gonna do this live boot in memory process, you had better make sure that your DHCP, Pixie provisioning, all of those components are not only HA, but can withstand the load of a full rack or a full data center reboot. Because in this pattern, if that infrastructure is not working, nothing is turning on. Okay. So yin yang, pros and cons. Now, if you're in uh, cloud infrastructure, then those, this, this uh, core OS pattern, which is the main place it is um, that I see it, is really simple because in that case you have, you're basically creating and destroying machines all the time. It's the normal pattern. Um, but once again, you're, you're dragging a lot of information in to your system every time it starts. And that can have, a, that actually has a surprising amount of overhead. So the alternative here is to do an image deploy system. So in this case, what you're doing is instead of uh, deploying a base system and then configuring it, what you're doing is you're building an image that has all, this, all the pre-configuration in it so that that image has your binaries, has your dependencies, has your Docker containers, has all of your configuration files. Hopefully it doesn't have your passwords and configuration keys in it. Um, but that image basically has everything you need to run. So when that system boots, it doesn't have to run any configuration script. It can literally just start the applications running as if they were already installed because they are already installed. So all of your system processes, all your containers, all your management. The thing that you have to do with this is it doesn't eliminate the things that make that system unique. So you still have to boot a system when you run it and initialize it, install its identity, its IP address, inject keys or credentials. Um, all of those things still need to get done as part of your normal initialization process. But that is not configuration. I would argue that's really initialization, right? Your application is already installed. The thing that was amazing to me, because I've seen this process, right? We, 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 we hear about this process a bit. We've been talking about it for a long time in the OpenStack communities, is how much faster this process is than a traditional deployment process. So if you have a pipeline and can build these images, and that's, I'll talk about that in a second, we're seeing a five times improvement in deployment performance, right? And that's just on base, right? If you're actually deploying something big with a lot of components in it or a very complex install process like Docker, uh, which isn't that complex, but it's surprisingly slow, the improvement that you get by putting that in this image and then deploying it already configured can save you orders of magnitude in your deployment times. And if you're doing Windows, which this crowd probably isn't doing a lot of Windows, but if you're doing Windows, this can actually save you multiple reboots. It can save you uh, 10, you know, 20 or 30 times a deployment uh, process. The challenge here is that if you're gonna do image deployment, you need an automated build process. You don't wanna be doing these things by hand. You're, you're building a live boot system and there are tools that will help you do it. So when I see people building these images, they're doing it from an automated position. They're still using configuration management tooling, 
they're still installing things in machines, but what they're doing is they're doing that as part of a pipeline system. Once that pipeline system is built, the image, then they capture it into a, a machine image that they can now deploy in multiple locations. And the fun thing about this is that once you've built that image, it's actually pretty portable. So you can take that same image, deploy it to a cloud infrastructure, you can deploy it to metal. It really doesn't matter. It becomes a much more portable image than what you were doing if you were trying to then do post-configuration. Because post-configuration depends on you being able to drag in things over the internet, and that becomes a, a sort of a crapshoot type of, of problem. Crap, it's in dice. Uh, so there's a lot of interesting tools with that. And it, it is work, right? Um, and it sounds slow, but it's really not as big a challenge as people think, especially for the benefits that you get in not having to do production management uh, systems. It's actually a much safer, faster, faster, safer, and more secure and scalable way to do these deployments. And one of the things that makes it more secure is that you don't have to have SSH enabled on your systems if you're doing this type of model. You might still choose to, or you might choose to have the option to have SSH so you can access the systems. But in a lot of immutable deployment, just like in containerized deployment, since you're, going, you're, you're using, the systems are already tested and working as they were built, you shouldn't have to go in and, and tweak with them. You shouldn't need an agent um, or Ansible connection that allows you to come in and have root access to your system. So you get a benefit of being able to basically deploy an artifact and then, and then use it. And if there's a problem, very often, the simplest answer is to destroy that artifact. Right? Or, and this gets really exciting, you can take the exact same artifact you deployed in, in production, spin it up on a laptop or spin it up in a lab, and see exactly what's going on. So the amount of variability in your infrastructure has gone way, way down, because you now can replicate exactly what was created every single time. All right, I'm going to pause. Questions so far? My demo only takes about 10 minutes, so I'm cruising. Cool. All right. So here's the demo. I, I, I have pictures because otherwise the demo is really just watching things flash on screens, which is, I guess, what a good demo should be. But beforehand, we've built an image. So we have, a, in this case, we have a CentOS image that was pre-built, um, was captured from a live CentOS system, uh, cloned and zipped into a, a TGZ uh, CentOS image from our reference system. What we're going to demo here is taking that image. I'll show you where we do it. And we're going to take a, a pre-boot, a pre, a booted uh, system. So we have, um, for, for digital rebar, we have an in-memory boot system that does discovery and inventory. And we do all sorts of work in that system uh, called Sledgehammer. We're, uh, on my laptop, I have uh, three VMs that are running in that system. It's pretty cool. And what we're going to do is we're going to invoke some script automation that pulls down that image, drops it on the hard disk, fixes the partitions, does all that work, um, and then re we'll reboot the system and do some cloud initialization, a little bit of post configuration, and then you'll have a working CentOS system. On my laptop, a normal CentOS install would take five or six minutes, just using a normal kickstart process. And we work really hard to optimize that, so it's pretty fast. With this system, it's less than uh, 60 seconds. It's about 45 seconds to go through this whole process. So 5x improvement in performance just on base CentOS. Of course, there is an initialization step. So we do have a CloudNet system, and we have to generate CloudNet templates and inject data back and forth. I, I keep bringing this back up because one of the things that you have to realize is in any of these processes, you need to realize how you're going to do that post-initialization because there is no, you know, you're creating a base image. You're not creating one image per system. You're creating a class, really a class of, of infrastructure. OK. Everybody ready for demo? Good. Uh, there's one more thing. I, I actually added a little bonus into this demo on some other work that we had done, because I think this is, first, it's helpful for my laptop. And two, I think it's really cool. So one of the things that's really nice about this pattern is that you also want to be able to not have to do a, uh, just blow everything away. You're actually switching out an operating system, so you're rebooting. So one of the things I added in here uh, is some cluster logic, 
where we, we have some workflow that uh, basically builds a cluster dynamically and then can step through a clus the cluster stage by stage. So in the demo that I'm gonna show you, I don't just take all three machines and destroy them. Uh, the first machine is gonna start, it'll identify one machine to start, and then it'll roll through one machine at a time. And my laptop is much happier not doing three simultaneous deployments. So. Everybody good? All right. Uh, so this is the, the Digital Rebar uh, user interface. Digital Rebar open source um, stuff is a CLI, API-driven um, provisioning infrastructure. You're welcome to check that out, um, rebar.digital. I'm gonna stick to the UX for the demos, um, which is something that my company adds on top of Digital Rebar. And what the system has done is I've put all of these machines in a profile called image deploy. And that profile basically has a um, tarball in here with CentOS in it. And then we have to, we identify as Linux and what, what the profile is. And then there's a workflow. I'm not clicking in the right place. So there's a workflow here um, I clicked on this one and it shows it down the side. Um, we have the decorators for the cluster, so I added to the cluster, I stepped through the cluster. Uh, and then the logic is pretty straightforward. We have the image deploy process, which is really writing that image through the in-memory boot process directly to disk. From there, we um, will then tell it to reboot, so you can see the system identifies in between these stages, it identifies that there's a, an a boot env, a boot environment change, and it'll automatically trigger a reboot. Um, from there, it actually will then, when the system boots, it'll generate the cloud initialization files. Um, those cloud initialization files are only available while the system's in that stage because they might have confidential data or initialization keys or things like that. It installs a runner service that gives us control of the system after it's been booting. That's optional, but it's super handy to make the workflows go. Uh, and then when we're done with that, we remove it from the cluster, which then tells the next machine in this cluster that it can advance through the stage. So you'll actually watch it go through all three steps. And then when it's done, it's done. So when I go through that process here, what I wanna do is I wanna take the three machines that I've staged, and I'm gonna get them a little bit more aligned on the screen so you can watch them boot. Uh, so in this case, they're just three VMs running on my, my laptop. And I'm gonna go ahead and put them through this image deploy state. I did it right. Um, so it's, a it's going through the cluster in the background. Let me make this a little bit, I'm gonna make it smaller. Tell me if it gets too small. That'll make things easier. What it's done is it's selected one of the nodes to go through and do the deployment. It's the machine three on the bottom. Um, that machine three, find it over here, just completed the, disk, the DD of the disk, it was that fast, um, and now it's going through the reboot process, and it's gonna go ahead, um, and it's booting into the CentOS disk. So it takes almost as long to copy the image as it does to reboot the infrastructure and start, start the machines. Um, so this is a normal boot process at this point. Um, and as soon as it's done with that, it will identify that process and uh, kick over into the next. So this one just started, you saw it finished. That then released the next one, and so um, the next machine, which is machine one, is gonna start the boot process. In this case, since I've shown it, I'm gonna go, go ahead and identify, um, I jumped, I clicked down, and I went into the task that's actually running that process. And in that process, uh, we're getting a live log back as it transfers that image. So I can actually watch, this is where the transparency component of operational software is really important to me. As this process is occurring, we're actually getting live log messages back from the machine about what's going on. So if there's a problem or a hung task, or we're in a loop, we can actually see live that that loop is going on and repeating. Um, all of this is API driven. So I could be subscribing to my API or I could go to my CLI and get exactly the same information. It's not as pretty. Um, but at this point, that, that job is gonna finish. Let's see. That job is finished, it's released the queue uh, back in. And so this is, we've got a, a log of all the systems going through this process. And now at this point, it's gonna complete all of the, 
workflows. But because I was able to use the cluster uh, provisioning process, I'm able to, one, slow it down a little bit for you, but also uh, have a nice controlled process. So if I had 100 machines, in this case, I would be able to step through that process, or I could step through two at a time or three at a time, however, however I want to manage that. This type of automation is very powerful because now when I'm going to scale in a cluster for you know, remote clusters or hundreds of machines, now I actually have a way to have very specific control of exactly what's going on in my environment. I can monitor it. I can, I can push an image for my systems out at a very, you know, in a very controlled way, um, allowing myself to, to take that remote infrastructure and manage it um, really without any human intervention, which is our, which is our goal. Um, and then everything that I'm, we're doing actually generates event logs back so it can be monitored by external systems. Um, there's a whole bunch more here. This isn't, I'm not trying to demo too much of the rebar piece. I'm more trying to show you the, the workflow and process for immutability. Um, okay. And with that, that's the end of the demo. The, which leads us to having a couple minutes left over for questions. Strategy to avoiding downtime when using this sort of method? So what you want to do, so the question, uh, yeah, I don't have to repeat the questions. Um, to avoid downtime in this infrastructure, uh, what you're, what you're, you will have downtime right, because you're actually re-imaging the systems completely. You have to have a certain breadth of systems, and then you have to have some awareness of what they're doing so that you don't take down all of your cluster nodes at once. Um, I didn't dwell on this in the, in the, in the intro slides. E if you, even if you're doing configuration management systems, as you're doing a rolling upgrade, you still have to isolate systems and prepare them, right, drain them from work, do the upgrades, you know, rejoin the cluster and do all that additional work. Um, which, is downtime, which is actually downtime on an individual system. In either way, you're, you're still encountering, you're still creating a window where you've identified a system that has to be replaced. Um, the thing that, that has been surprising to me is that while it sounds like replacing a whole system just to patch it is gonna create a bigger service interruption, in a lot of cases, um, these, these redeploys are so fast from that model that by the time you've drained it, um, and you've done this, you, you're actually faster than if you tried to do a patch with any complexity or all. Even a small patch um, can be fraught with, with peril, depending on how it works. Right? But yeah, so you, you do, you do, there's no free, free lunch. You have to be aware of the system that you're changing, flip it. Um, and what we've been seeing is the time it takes to do that flip is, is pretty minimal. When you, when you have it staged correctly and, and you rehearse it. Yeah, there's no, there's no free lunch. You still have to rehearse upgrades. You still have to coordinate taking nodes out of service. Um, the, be, the best thing about this is that uh, you can actually rehearse the actual images that you're gonna deploy, which you can't easily do in a production environment. Um, right, if, if once it's in production, you, you, you're not always sure what's there, especially if you've patched it a couple of times. So I've been through a lot of deployments where you're trying to figure out, all right, what, what did we actually deploy? What's actually here? And in these cases, you can actually get the full systems and know exactly what you're dealing with. So it's a good question. Other questions? Yeah. So, so the, the question is a hybrid approach. Totally yes. Um, Right? The, my, my point here is not to say there's only one thing. You have to create huge images. Uh, there are a lot of people, especially as an intermediate step, that build pretty complete images, like monthly, and then they still use their patch management, configuration management uh, to do I intermediate upgrades um, and not go full out on it. It's a very reasonable approach. Um, what you might find is that as you get better at the immutable piece, you can shrink the configuration pieces down. Um, there's an added benefit in here that I didn't mention, which is while you're in that in-memory state, you can then patch the BIOS, you can check the configuration, you can burn it in, you can do all sorts of system diagnostics. Um, and so that process can actually um, create some interesting benefits. 
But yeah, it's totally acceptable to do that. And, and you might still want to put your configuration management stuff in or have your, your SSH keys because you might say, oh, I, want, I need to do an emergency patch and it's much faster for me to knife, if you're a chef person, knife or Ansible out a task across all your machines. Um, hopefully some of you are saying, I hope to never have to do that again. And if you can actually roll an update with, a new, with the patch in it um, reliably across your system, this is actually a really nice way to get that done. Um, so, but yeah, hybrid's fine. So you actually answered most of my questions already, awesome. which is great, so thank you. Um, but do you, can you recommend any sort of best practices or approaches for dealing with those larger data systems like databases or like fig fat beast that you don't want to just copy around all the time? That is a great question. So um, there, there are some patterns. Um, and I, I, we wrote, uh, my, co my CTO and I wrote an article um, that's on the, it's a dev, I think it's devops.com or the new stack, one of the two. I, th I think it's referenced in here. Um, that you can, you don't have to re-image the whole system. So it's, it, one of the ways to approach this is you can actually take a, an OS partition and just re-image the OS partition, which is where a lot of the, the challenge lives, and you can keep your data on separate drives or disks. So it'd be perfectly acceptable in a data infrastructure, to a database infrastructure, to say, all right, I'm replacing the OS and my database software, but I'm leaving the, the actual databases on a separate partition with a RAID volume or something, and, and, just, and, leave the, and just cycle the top, the OS, and leave the data in place. Uh, very, it's a very practical way to, to handle this. It requires more logic because you can't move things around. One of the benefits of an immutable practice is that sometimes you like to be able to um, treat your machines as, as you know, sort of disposable machines and then you're gonna turn them over. In that case, you would tag them more specifically as, with a function. Um, so a cluster control plane or something like that. Yeah, but that's totally doable um, from that perspective. It's a good question. More questions? Yeah. So the question is, how do you handle post-provisioning configuration changes? There's, there's a couple ways to do it. Um, you, know, you can try and do it with Cloud Init. One of the reasons we install our agent, reinstall our agent on the system is because you might have some additional, small additional steps that you want to do. Or you might have um, an infrastructure, you, know, you might actually just put Chef Puppet Ansible Salt, just do it the way you've already been doing it. That's OK. What you probably want to do is try and find ways to you know, streamline out those steps. But if, you have a, if you're a shop that's already doing that, put the agent on. Don't, there's no reason not to put the agent on and keep control if you, if you have to do a system like that. So a hybrid approach or where you're stepping into it makes perfect sense. Um, that's why I presented all three models because you can get a lot of immutability out of your current system by just saying instead of patching, we're gonna destroy and then slowly build up that, that image that you start with so it has more and more capabilities. Right, that's a per perfectly reasonable way to do it. Um, yeah, this, this shouldn't be an all or nothing process. Um, and that's, I, I really like to emphasize that because there's no reason for somebody to feel like I can't do a full image deployment, therefore I'm not immutable. Uh, it's not like that at all, right? It's not operationally helpful for you to be that much of a purist. I'm, I'm not like that. Cool. Well, I have one minute left. Last questions? Sure. Well, what's, what's the biggest scale you've seen this actually implemented at in terms of, obviously, it's really a number of bigger infrastructure. Yeah. It's, uh, um, so the question is, what's the biggest scale? Um, hundreds of machines is, is what we've been seeing um, from that perspective. And most of, the, most of the people that we're working with are starting with 100, like um, a build, a render farm right, where they, they need 100 machines every night to render, and so they, they re-render every, every night, and so they rebuild 100 machines every night. Um, that's that's a, a good use case. But the thing that surprised us, right, because I've been doing NetBoot provisioning for, for years and automating it and optimizing it, was that once we got used to this process, we never wanted to NetBoot again. Right, I can't, I can't emphasize this enough, right? I, my CTO was coming back from one of the, the first installs we were doing and said, I think we should never kickstart again, right? Linux, 
Windows, whatever. Like we don't, we stopped supporting Windows standard installs. We only support Windows by immutable infrastructure at this point because it's fast, which we like. We don't like watching paint dry, but it's safer. And I, I'm stunned by this, right? When we can actually watch the system, you know, build the partition table and drop things into the partition tables and then fix them, we are much more confident that things are going to boot than before. Uh, and that's a really big, that's a really, really big deal. So the transparency of operation, which is a key, key driver for us and how we build software, um, is something we can do. And speaking of that, uh, I'm out of time. If you're interested in playing with this, um, Digital Rebar is the project. It takes about five minutes to install. It's all Golang. It's super easy. So you can try this yourself. The uh, image-based deployment stuff is something that Rackin adds. So that would be contact us and we'll, we'll help you get started with that. We totally make it available for people who want to play with it. It just requires l some training to learn how to build an image. To do this stuff, literally you could be up in an hour. It's very, very simple. We, we really work hard on that. So I appreciate your time and attention. Thank you very much.